afternoon. Uh, welcome to the webinar. We're going to talk about uh, a couple drought tools today and then get a uh, short drought update, sort of fitting with the uh, the theme of the day. Uh, my name is Doug Cluck, K-L-U-C-K, <laughs> from NOAA, uh, based in Kansas City. And uh, we're going to hear from uh, three different speakers, like I just mentioned. The first will be Matt Rodell from NASA. Um, I'll let him do his own introduction in terms of what he's going to be talking about. Then our next speaker will be Danelle Peck from USDA. And then finally, Becky Bulling Bullinger from uh, the Colorado State University State Climate Office. And this is being recorded. Uh, I will, we will later send out where, where the uh, address is for um, where it's being placed a little bit later. Also, um, if you if questions come up in your mind, because uh, we're all we're all uh, silenced at the moment, muted. So if any questions come up, there's a question panel. You can put your questions in there, and we'll get to those at the end. I hope if we have time to do that. Um, I'll also be sending out in the chat section a URL that will allow you to download um, a pretty massive. Uh, uh, presentation uh, directly for uh, Matt's presentation because it uh, it has so several animations in it that take up a lot of room. So if you want that, um, I will put it there eventually. So look for it as we go along. And I think that's all I have to say in to start things up. Matt, why don't you uh, take over and talk about uh, the first subject here, the Grace FO. Okay, great. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so I'm Matt Riddell. I'm a hydrologist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, and we've developed a few drought products that are being uh, disseminated by the National Drought Mitigation Center, and I'm going to be describing um, actually three of those products. One of them, you know, been around for a while, and two of them that are new. And just to reiterate what Doug says, if he's able to put that um, that URL on the chat box, I guess, um, you may think about downloading that and then um, and I'll try to continue to say which slide number I'm on. The reason for that is because some of the animations, um, I'm just not sure how well they're going to go through uh, on this type of a webinar if they're going to be fast enough. So, so let me get moving here. Um, going on to slide two, I think. I'm pressing page down. It's not going to the next slide. There it is. Okay. So, um, so sort of the motivation here um, for a lot of things we do at NASA is that, uh, in terms of earth science, is that there really aren't enough observations on the ground to do everything that we want to do. So for example, if you're interested in, in hydrology and meteorology, um, and you're, you want to use in-situ observations, there's the global telecommunication system, which is shown in the, uh, the upper left, and those are meteorological stations that only uh, measure air temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, wind speed, and humidity. Um, and you can see it's it's pretty dense over the you know the the wealthier, more populated parts of the world. But then if you go somewhere like interior Africa, um, pretty big distance between those yellow dots. Um, the lower left shows um, river flow observations that are collected by the Global Runoff Data Center in Germany. And um, the the cooler the color, um, you know, like a dark blue, that means the observations are pretty recent, but the yellows and reds, those observations aren't available, you know, for several years or could be 10, 20, 30 years since the last observation uh, was available or, or is available through that database. Um, if you're interested in groundwater monitoring, and we've talked a fair amount about groundwater in this talk, um, for, uh, uh, for the global scale in the upper right, uh, there are a few countries that contribute their, their observations. Or, or some observations to the uh, Global Groundwater Monitoring Network, uh, which is in um, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, there are some restrictions on their use. It's a little better in the U.S. Um, and the lower right shows the uh, USGS Groundwater Climate Response Network, which is their wells that have a you know pretty significantly long record, and they're most of them are not directly influenced by pumping or that sort of thing. Um, and uh, they can therefore be used for sort of uh, evaluating climate effects on on groundwater. But again, um, you know, 
eastern U.S. pretty well, you know, pretty dense at least from this this um, this U.S. wide view. Uh, a lot of the western U.S. not well represented. So, um, so I'm going on the next slide here. Um, this shows NASA's current Earth science missions. Uh, so, a fleet of satellites um, circling the Earth and making observations, um, and many of them are uh, are relevant to hydrology. I'm going to be talking mainly about um, GRACE and GRACE follow-on, which you can see near the top there. So what is GRACE? Um, GRACE was a mission that launched in, um, in 2002, and whereas most uh, Earth Science Remote Sensing missions are measuring either emitted or, or uh, reflected wavelengths of light um, across the EM spectrum, and, and different wavelengths are better for for interpreting or, or inferring different types of um, uh, different types of uh, near surface phenomena, um, but you're limited in that uh, with it, this conventional type of remote sensing, you can't uh, measure anything below the first few centimeters of the land surface. Grace it was uh, totally different. Um, Grace was uh, actually two satellites. Uh, orbiting the Earth together, and uh, instead of looking down, they're actually looking at each other, sort of monitoring each other's orbit. And um, and from that information, scientists can make maps of Earth's gravity field at uh, extremely high precision, um, high enough precision that we actually see changes in the gravity field over time. Um, the gravitational potential is related to the amount of mass near the surface. Uh, so as that mass changes, um, there are actually uh, accompanying changes in in gravity that you wouldn't feel walking along the ground, but uh, but it's enough to perturb the orbits of the satellites in a predictable way, and uh, and it turns out that it makes no difference, you know, whether these uh, mass changes occur right at the surface or you know it could be you know a mile or or more below the surface, um, it's still going to affect the satellite orbits, and therefore, um, as I'm going to show, we're able to interpret these observations to understand things like uh, um, how storage in aquifers is changing over time. So if I go on to slide five here, showing um, what GRACE and GRACE follow-on you know, look like when they're orbiting. It's, it's one satellite following the other. They're about, about 200 kilometers apart from each other. Every five seconds, they're measuring that distance, that separation between the satellites uh, down to micron precision, which means they're measuring this 200 kilometer distance down to the size of a red blood cell, um, about every five seconds. Over the course of the month of a month, if you take all these observations, um, put them together, you can construct um, the shape of the gravity field that would have that, that has to occur in order to to, uh, to create the observed orbits. Um, these these uh, images are showing an example of what happens as uh, these gravity satellites approach a mountain range. So if there's a mountain range, is when there's more mass means there's more gravitational potential. And what happens is as they're approaching, the, the lead satellite sort of gets pulled forward a little, little faster by that extra gravity there and the separation between the satellites increases. As they, as they pass over the mountain range, the first satellite sort of held back. The second one is, uh, is speeding up to that, towards that, that gravitational anomaly. And then as they, as they continue on, um, things equal out a little more. Again, the satellite observations from GRACE and GRACE following are so precise, though, that we're not only monitoring these static uh, gravitational variations and, 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 and mass anomalies, but actually uh, they can monitor changes uh, in the gravity field and therefore changes in mass over time. So going on to slide six, what does this mean for, for hydrology? Well, um, turns out the mass changes that that occur most commonly on a monthly to interannual basis um, over the land are changes in, in water storage. So the three big types of mass changes that affect the gravity satellite are, are uh, ocean mass changes. So think about ocean circulation and tides, uh, atmospheric mass variability, which you can measure um, you know, based on uh, surface pressure observations. And then over the land, again, it's the terrestrial water storage. So that's all of the water in the entire column, the groundwater, soil moisture, snow, surface water, ice, um, all of that water sort of um, integrated into one quantity um, is what we can infer from these gravity observations. And how these vary over time, you can see um, uh, th this is 
using data from Illinois, which is one of the few regions in the world where we have reasonably dense networks of observations of groundwater, soil moisture, snow, and then also we can um, use reservoir storage observations to estimate the, uh, the surface water contribution. Um, the time series in the upper left shows um, time series of, of groundwater in blue, soil moisture in red, and uh, snow in white. And it turns out in, in Illinois, the, uh, the surface water variations are too small to even see on this type of a chart. Um, but but uh, so this is a, a, uh, a roughly 22 year time series. Um, the, uh, the Y axis shows water storage um, uh, in millimeters. So if you took all the water in the, in the groundwater and the snow and the, and the soil moisture and, um, and ponded it at the surface, and then measured how the height of, or that the depth of that water was changing over time. That's what this this um, this time series is is showing. So you can see that the uh, the red, the soil moisture, has the largest variations, but the uh, the groundwater variations are, are significant as well. And in fact, they're they're quite large on an interannual basis. Uh, in Illinois, snow is a pretty small small part of it, and surface water is even smaller. But depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, you know, snow or surface water could be the dominant component. Um, but I want to point out too that the yellow circles there show. Uh, you remember the big drought in the uh, uh, in the upper you know Midwest and Mississippi in in 1988 and 89. Um, you can see that pretty clearly there. Um, and then in the um, uh, later on in 1993, uh, there is a huge flood in the Mississippi. And that's that's pretty clear in this time series as well in both the uh, both the groundwater uh, and the soil moisture. Uh, the the lower right just shows a, a pretty well known um, uh, chart uh, from uh, from Stanley Chanian showing um, so the propagation of of, uh, of a pre precipitation anomaly through the land surface water storage components. Um, and uh, uh, you know this is one of the things we're thinking about. Um, when we look at the variations in these different components of terrestrial water storage, and you see how particularly um, groundwater at the bottom there has a sort of a delayed response to precipitation, and it also smooths out a lot of the high frequency variability. So going on to slide uh, seven, um, if this if you can see the animation going here, what it shows is is what Grace is measuring these terrestrial water storage anomalies. And when I say anomaly, it, it means relative to the, the long-term mean at any given location. So if it's blue, it means it's, it's wetter than normal at that location. Red means it's drier than normal at that location. And you can see on the left, this is, uh, you see there's seasonal variability, particularly if you look at like the Amazon, there's a very large seasonal variability. It gets, gets uh, wet in the uh, northern summer and dry in the uh, northern winter. If you're interested in something like extremes, like droughts, and floods, then what you can do is remove the mean seasonal cycle. If you do that, it looks like what you see on the right there, uh, non-seasonal uh, terrestrial water storage anomalies. And so these would be indicators of, of where you might be having a drought or, um, or in some cases a flood. If we go on to next slide, slide eight, you see how this compares um, to the uh, US drought monitor. Um, there was a big drought in, in 07 or through 08, 09 in the southeastern U.S. And you see there's pretty decent correspondence there just between the raw grace observations on the left and the U.S. drought monitor on the right. Um, one, there are a couple of issues, though, with making use of these grace and grace follow-on data. The first is that the, the resolution is very low. Um, so if, you know, if you're interested in drought monitoring, you really need something that's higher spatial resolution than what GRACE can provide. Um, we like to say that you know, the, the effective great, uh, temporal, uh, sorry, the effective spatial resolution of GRACE is about 150,000 square kilometers, or about the size of the state of Illinois. So that's a, that's a pretty coarse observation. Um, in addition, it's, it's monthly, and typically it takes a while for them to process. And you, so you may get the data two, three, four months after real time. So that makes it pretty hard to, to use for any sort of operational application. But I'm going to show you how we, we get, um, get past those, those challenges. So going to slide nine here, what we do is we, we basically merge the GRACE observations with, with other observation-based information within a land service model. 
So um, hoping you all have a good idea, you know, reasonably good idea of what a land surface model is. If you don't, it's basically sort of like the, um, the land component of a weather or climate forecast model, except um, typically more uh, sophisticated in it. And it simulates what happens to the water and energy after it hits the land surface in the form of um, you know, uh, precipitation and sunlight. Um, so what we do is we run the model. We use uh, inputs, things like uh, observation-based precipitation and solar radiation and other meteorological inputs that are observation-based, um, along with static parameters like the vegetation types, uh, soil type, that sort of thing. Uh, the model then runs forward in time and comes up with estimates of things like the soil moisture, groundwater storage, uh, runoff, evapotranspiration. But what we can do is, is um, we can combine those, those uh, model simulated quantities, uh, which, are, which we can, you know, we can run at very high resolution. We can, you know, there are some runs up to one kilometer resolution. We're typically running these days at about 12 kilometers over the US. Um, we take these high resolution um, fields generated by the model, and then we can incorporate the, uh, the GRACE observations, which are lower uh, spatial and temporal resolution, but they also can steer the model more towards the truth of what's what's happening in the terrestrial water storage. So we used a model called the Catchman Land Surface Model that was developed at NASA Goddard. Uh, we run it from 1948 um, up to present it, with no data simulation. That provides our background climatology to give us an understanding of the range of variability of terrestrial water storage, particularly the soil moisture and the groundwater at each location. Um, we then do the data simulation, which basically is an optimal merging, uh, aims to reduce the errors in both the, the observation and the model. Um, knowing the, you know, by knowing the errors in both, you can come up with an optimal estimate. Um, we use the NLDS2 uh, observation-based meteorological forcing, um, and we come up with outputs of groundwater and then also root sun and surface soil moisture um, that based on the climatology, we convert to percentiles for each location and each time of year, um, percentiles of the of the wetness. Um, so we've been doing this since uh, 2011. Um, an example shown here shows the, there's a grace field in the lower left there. Uh, we assimilated it into the model and the outputs are things like the surface soil moisture, roots on soil moisture and groundwater, which have been converted here to, um, to percentiles or wetness percentiles, uh, again, based on each specific location and time of year. And so if it's in the fifth, wetness percentile for example that means it's for that location and time of year it's only that dry five percent of the time that drier drier five percent of the time so uh and if you compare those with the u.s drought monitor map in the upper right you can see that there's pretty good um comparison between them but but there are differences because the drought monitor tries to um tries to incorporate a lot of different information on um uh, on drought into one product uh, where these are specific to the, the surface and roots on soil moisture and groundwater. Going on to slide 10, um, if you press, I have to click play on this thing, but um, this just animates um, our, our roots on soil moisture and shallow groundwater drought indicators over time, just to give you an idea of, of how, they, how they change over time. And you can see roots on soil moisture, because it's in more direct communication with the atmosphere, changes much more quickly uh, than the shallow groundwater uh, shown on the right there. Um, there are definitely um, some, some things that are similar about the two, but then also um, you know, sort of an integrated response in the shallow groundwater on the right. And this is fun to watch, when I, but I'm gonna keep going so I can stay on time. Okay, uh, slide 11, uh, just showing that we've done some, some evaluation of our drought fields, uh, uh, comparisons with the US drought monitor. Uh, this is a comparison between our, our shallow groundwater drought indicator and the um, U.S. drought monitor uh, over the entire U.S. The percentage of area in each type of in each drought category. And just to simplify this, if you look at the lower right, that's uh, for all drought categories, which basically means that it, you know, as it's defined in the objective blends that the USDM uses, um, if you're below the 30th percentile of wetness, then you're in drought. And uh, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting here is I think um, you know, USDM tends to be overly cautious on defining uh, drought, and so so their their average is well above or, you know, well above 30 percent, which is what you'd expect. You know, the long-term average percentage area of the U.S. that's in drought should be about 30 percent if that's how you're defining it. 
Um, that's right where we are with our blue, the, you know, the blue line there is the uh, shallow groundwater uh, drought indicator. The red line is the uh, USDM. And you can see there's there's pretty good correspondence between the two. Um, don't expect them to be perfect, but I think there's, you know, it's, it's pretty good. And, um, and again, that offset is caused by us being um, exactly limited to that 30, 30 um, percentile, uh, whereas USDM is, is a little more, um, uh, you know, subjective. Going on to slide um, 12, um, this is uh, one of our new products, is a, is a forecast. So what we've done is we do the same thing we did before. We run our grace data simulation up to near real time, and then we run into the future using downscaled uh, seasonal forecast model predictions. So we got a forecast model prediction from NASA's GEOS-5 model. Um, we do some uh, spatial and temporal downscaling to, to make it useful for, for forcing a model. And then we start from our grace data simulation um, current state and we run three months into the future using that downscaled forcing and come up with forecasts of the uh, of the groundwater and soil moisture. So this is showing an example here that was initialized on June 1st, 2019. So that was the, the end of the great data simulation run and we ran three months into the future. And then what we do is we compare on the right with uh, with what actually happened later on. So so the right is our, our shows our groundwater analysis, roots on soil moisture analysis. So you compare the uh, compare the first column with the third column, and compare the second column with the fourth column. So for uh, so we looked for the first one. You know we did a pretty good job of um, of uh, at least matching the patterns. If you remember last summer, it was quite a bit wetter than it was. A, it was generally a wet summer in the in the central and northeastern parts of the U.S. Um, you know wetter than expected. So you can kind of see that come out. Going on to the next one, slide 13. You can see. Um, so two months out, you know, we're still getting those patterns pretty well, but not quite as wet as we should be. And then uh, uh, similarly with three months out, again, pretty good job capturing the patterns of, of drought and wetness, uh, but not quite as wet as it turned out to be uh, last summer. Finally, um, uh, this is my last uh, slide before the summary. Um, we're doing this at the global scale now too. So we had been running our great data simulation just over the continental U.S. We are now doing it um, at the at the uh, the global scale, um, and so what you see here is is upper left the uh, the open loop from the model. That means the model with no data simulation. Um, the uh, the upper right shows the grace fields, the grace uh, terrestrial water storage anomalies, and the lower right shows the terrestrial water storage anomalies after we assimilate the grace data into the model. And as you'd expect, it ends up being somewhere between the two. Um, but the advantages are we get the high resolution um, of the model that comes from the other observational inputs. Um, but at the same time, we get um, you know, sort of steered towards reality by the, uh, the GRACE observations. Um, so this is something new. It's also served from the National Drought Mitigation Center website, along with the, uh, the original uh, drought monitoring and wetness monitoring tools and the forecasts. Um, they're all there. I'll show you that URL in a second. Um, and these are being made available. Um, oh, I do have one more slide here, slide 16. So, um, so we did a little bit of evaluation of this too. It's hard to um, uh, it's hard to evaluate at the global scale because there just aren't that many drought products available uh, globally, and that's one of the motivations for creating this this new product. Uh, but if we compare it, slide 17, with um, with this uh, this uh, precipitation index based approach. Uh, you can see the URL there um, for the for the upper right. You can circle, you know, sort of the, the big things that are going on in December 2019. And there's a pretty good correspondence between between our um, our race-based maps and and what they do with the, um, uh, the precipitation indices. Okay, so here's my summary. And um, uh, I think I'm you know right about over time here. So I'll leave this up and I'd be happy to take any questions from here. Yep. Thanks, Matt. And um, go ahead and uh, anybody wants to read that, feel free. I'm going to switch it over here in just a moment to Danelle uh, to talk about GrassCast. But I also want to mention that uh, we have another expert on the phone from the National Drought Mitigation Center um, who is uh, co collaborating on this uh, this general effort. Uh, Brian Fuchs is on. So let me um, 
change presenter here to Danelle. And let's see if the magic of the internet works. Oh yeah, there we go. Thanks, and take it away, Danelle, as soon as you want to. Great, Doug. Uh, Doug, tell me, are you seeing my full screen or um, my slide deck? Slide deck, yeah, not full screen yet. Okay, there we go. Hopefully that fixes that. Yep, perfect. Great. Okay, um, so thanks everyone for sticking around for presentation number two. My name is Danelle Peck. I'm the director of the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub based out of Fort Collins, Colorado. And I'm a member of the GrassCast team. So today I just wanted to give you a quick introduction. What is GrassCast and why should you care? Um, before I do that, I just wanna point out that this effort um, in developing GrassCast and producing it every two weeks um, is a multi-institutional and, and multi-agency effort. Uh, so the USDA, um, several agencies, ARS, NRCS, the Climate Hub, uh, FSA is getting increasingly involved along with a lot of university partners who have been critical in developing grass cast. So Colorado State, um, some folks down at Arizona and uh, in Nebraska. So thanks to all of our, our partners. Um, and it's mostly been funded by USDA and the National Drought Mitigation Center. Let me just get my forward going here. There we go. So the motivation for GrassCast was this, uh, that about three years ago, before GrassCast was, was developed, we relied really heavily on uh, NOAA's three-month precipitation outlooks when we would go out and speak with ranchers in the Northern Plains region. Um, we would carry these three-month seasonal precipitation outlooks with us and um, share those with the ranchers and explain how to correctly interpret these, um, these outlooks. And inevitably, the next question out of their mouth was, so what? What does this mean for me as a rancher? Because what the rancher really cares about is how much grass is going to grow from all of that precipitation. And so in the past, we've asked ranchers to do that translation for themselves. And it's actually a lot more complicated than you might imagine. So we were asking them to do a lot. Uh, and so we realized, why don't we do that translation step for them? And that's when GrassCast was born. Instead of handing ranchers a precipitation outlook for the upcoming growing season, we can now hand them a grassland outlook. How many pounds per acre we think might grow in their area. So let's zoom into this example grass cast map. This is an old one, uh, but just as an example to help you understand how to interpret a grass cast map when you see it. So first, find a location on this map that you're interested in and note its color. And here's what that color is, is trying to tell you. GrassCast says, based on the weather we've observed up to the date that the map was made, so let's say this map was made on uh, April 15th. We've watched the weather all the way up to that date, April 15th, and then we combine that with what we think might happen with the weather over the rest of the growing season, essentially through August 31st. So we combine this observed weather to date plus some kind of forecast or scenario of what we think might happen over the rest of the growing season. And based on that information, we expect grassland productivity in your area to be some percentage higher or lower than your area's long-term average. So that's broadly how to interpret the grass cast map. And later I'll give you a specific example, a more recent example. Before we do that though, I don't want grass cast to be a black box. Uh, we want people to feel comfortable with, with how it's made. So this is just a very simple um, kind of four-step schematic to give you a sense for what's the science underlying grass cast. Um, so again, it all begins with um, observed daily weather plus some kind of forecasted daily weather. We feed that daily weather into a biological simulation model, a model that's very good at simulating how grass grows out on our rangelands. That model is called Descent. So we give that daily weather for the growing season to Descent. Descent spits out how much evapotranspiration it, it expects to happen over the upcoming growing season, right? Evapotranspiration is just how much water is moving from the soil into the roots and up through that plant and out its leaves. 
why do we care about evapotranspiration? Well, it turns out that that correlates really well to how green the grass is, how vigorously it's growing. You know, if it's green and bright, um, that means that it's growing healthy versus if it's not so green. If it's, you know, the, the tones are muted, it's more on the brown side, that suggests there's not a lot of evapotranspiration happen. Those plants aren't growing quite as vigorously as they normally would. And that's close to what we care about, but there's one final step needed. We need to translate that greenness into pounds per acre of grass that you know, are gonna grow out on our native rangelands, our native grasslands over the course of the season. Um, and then we're interested how those pounds per acre compare to, the, to, to an area's long-term average. So that's the four-step process we, we use to make grass cast. We don't have time today to dig into the, the science behind each of those steps. Um, but there's lots of resources on our website where you can dig into that science. So um, in this previous slide, sorry, in the previous slide, I showed a single grass cast map. And that's what I've been showing you so far. And I told you that it depends in part on, on what the, the forecasted weather is for the rest of the growing season. Well, it turns out it's really hard to forecast future precipitation, uh, especially in the Northern Plains region in the summertime. And so instead of um, relying on a single precipitation forecast, um, our ranchers and our partners at USDA, NRCS, and University Extension, they all ask us, like, don't, don't ask me to trust a single map with a single forecast. Instead, give us three possible scenarios. And so in that four-step process, we replace forecasted weather with instead kind of three precipitation scenarios. What if? precipitation uh, from the date that the map is made through the rest of the growing season, what if it's above normal? Then what would the grass cast maps look like? And what if you're wrong? What if that's not what happens? What if um, precipitation over the rest of the growing season is only near normal? Then what would your grass cast map look like? And finally, what if the spigot turns off for the rest of the growing season and it's below normal precipitation? Then what does the grass cast map look like? And so this, this more scenario-based, you know, give us a range of possibilities, gives us the current three-map GrassCast product. This is what you'll see if you go to the GrassCast website. Um, hopefully it's what you'll see if, if it's, um, you know, being posted in your, in your favorite ag newspaper, um, the three-map product. And I'm going to walk you through this because I know it looks overwhelming. So these maps that you're looking at right now were made on April 28th. So just about uh, 10 days ago, and they're telling us this. What if precipitation from April 28th through the end of August is above normal, the map on the left, near normal in the middle, or below normal on the right? Now, be careful. The, the labels at the top of the map, the above normal, near normal, below normal, those are referring to precipitation. But what the maps are actually communicating, those colors, is how much, you know, what percentage more or less um, grassland vegetation do we expect? How many more or less pounds per acre um, do we expect? So I'm going to walk you through an example to make sure you know how to interpret these grass cast maps. Again, pick a location that you're interested in. I've chosen a location in southern Colorado. Now choose that location in each of the three maps and look at the three colors. And here's what those colors are telling me from my location of interest. Starting on the left, if precipitation from April 28th through the end of August is above normal, then my location is green. And that says under those conditions, above normal precip, that area would only expect about 5% less to 5% more pounds per acre than their long-term average. In other words, near normal amounts of grass. So even if they get above normal precip, this area can only expect near normal amounts of, of grassland vegetation. What if that's not what happens? What if instead precipitation through the rest of the growing season is only near normal? Then how much grass would we expect to grow? So we go to our middle map, the color is yellow, and that says this area, if it gets near normal precip for the rest of the growing season, should expect to have 5 to 15% less pounds per acre. So even if they have near normal precip, we're expecting them to have below normal amounts of grass 
and specifically 5 to 15 percent less. Finally, again, what if the spigot turns off for the rest of the growing season? What if this area receives below normal amounts of precipitation for the rest of the growing season? How bad might it get? And this color is orange. And that says um, in this area, if the spigot turns off, they should expect 15 to 30 percent less pounds per acre. Now, that's not the worst possible outcome. There are reds on this map, and red is even worse. Um, but for this area, um, they should be prepared for 15 to 30 percent less pounds per acre. So that's how to interpret the grass cast maps, this set of three. It gives you a range of possibilities. And the next question we always get is, do we know which one of these maps is more or less likely? And to do that, we turn back to our friends at NOAA and go back to the three-month precipitation outlook. Um, we go to their, in fact, I like going to their interactive map. And I placed a dot here um, in, south, uh, in southern Colorado, same location. And for that location, when I look at the precipitation outlook, it shows me this jazzy little pie chart that shows equal chances. So currently, NOAA's outlook is not leaning towards any particular precipitation scenario. There's equal chances of either three, above normal, near normal, or below normal amounts of precipitation. And so for our grass cast maps, unfortunately, all I can tell the ranchers is each of these maps is equally likely. Now that said, notice that two of the three maps are indicating below average amounts of grass. So two out of the three scenarios are telling them they should be prepared for drought conditions. Now these maps get updated every two weeks as we observe more and more of the actual weather for the growing season. And so it's important to keep checking back. Don't just look at grass cast once. Come back and check it every few weeks as we learn more about how that growing season is actually unfolding. Um, and then in, on August 31st, that'd be the final set of maps. And those three maps will be identical because we'll, we will have observed all of the weather data for the growing season. We will know uh, how much grass GrassCast thinks has grown out on the ground. Now I wanted to highlight for this audience uh, an area of concern that I have uh, down here in southeastern Colorado and northeastern New Mexico. Um, I have concern for any area where two of the three maps are suggesting below average pounds per acre. So looking at the middle map, any area that's in yellow or orange, and then when we look at the right-hand map, any area that's in orange or red, those areas concern me. Two of the three maps are suggesting uh, that they might have below average amounts of grass for their cattle to graze. Um, especially concerning if, when we go back and look at NOAA's map, oh, let's see, sorry, let me go this way. If we go back to NOAA's map um, and look for that area, again, this outlook is telling us that the models are not leaning in a favorable direction. They're not leaning strongly towards um, above normal precipitation, these scenarios are equally likely. And so two of the three maps are, are sending us warning signals. Now, further north in the Northern Plains, there are some other areas that have yellow in the middle and orange or red on the right. But for those areas, when I look at the three month outlook, they're in green, suggesting that NOAA's three month outlook is leaning a bit st more strongly towards above normal precipitation. And so for those areas, I have some hope that they might, uh, you know, they might end up over on the left here, over in the above normal precipitation and be okay on the rangeland side. So I hope that under helps you understand how to interpret grass cast, how to combine it with NOAA's information. Um, with that, I just wanna point out that grass cast should not be used alone in isolation, you should combine it with your other drought related tools like the drought monitor, like a veg dry. Um, together, they can give you a more complete picture of what's actually happening out on the ground and where we expect to be going. Um, for those who actually are out on the ground um, and, and working in rangeland, you know, be sure to visit your local conditions. Get out of the truck and take a look at what's happening on the ground. Um, grass cast cannot account for local management decisions that have been made that could make an area either more vulnerable to drought or less vulnerable to drought. 
grass calf can't tell the difference between desirable grass species and undesirable weedy species like teat grass. So you have to know what your local conditions are and what that means about your vulnerability to drought. Is your area more or less vulnerable um, than just this broader context that grass cast represents? So to learn more about grass cast, you can visit our website, which is hosted by the National Drought Mitigation Center. Um, there's a great website there that with searchable and zoomable maps. Um, the grid size is actually six miles by six miles. So I, I should fix this third bullet point. It's not perfectly accurate. So think of it as six miles by six miles, a, a, a grid size cell. And we've got some tutorial videos there too. So if you go to that website, this is what it'll look like. This is a static image that you can easily download and print. But there's also a zoomable map where you can really get in and search for your location and get a much, um, you know, a much more precise look at your local area and what grass cast is, is indicating. Again, great tutorial videos there. This is a wonderful introductory video. There's a, a tutorial video, um, again, demonstrating how to interpret grass cast correctly. If you're into the science and you want to dig deeper, go to our, um, our FAQ tab at the top there. There's lots of Q&A there, um, so if we don't have time today, uh, you can go and see if your question has already been answered there. Um, but there's also a couple of our peer-reviewed uh, scientific papers. If you, again, you want to dig in, here's a couple of them, one from Ecosphere, one from Western Economics Forum that I think are, are nice and accessible. Um, there's also recorded science webinars. So you could spend a whole 45 to 60 minutes listening to, to the real scientists, Bill Parton and others, describing the science of grass cast. The last thing I'll say is that we are, um, we are currently in the process of expanding grass cast to all of New Mexico and Arizona. So we hope later this spring or summer to be able to share those publicly. Um, those will also be posted at that same grass cast website where you can also find a really great, if you're with the media, you can find a great press release from USDA Another excellent one from CSU. Um, and then you can follow the hashtag GrassCast on Twitter and you'll, you'll get updates for when we've posted new maps. So with that, thank you. Climate Hubs appreciate you being on the call today. We don't have time for questions. If you don't see it on the, the FAQ, please feel free to email me. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Danelle. Very nice. Uh, one quick question that always comes up after you give a talk, I've noticed. Is it how come this doesn't go any further east? Do you want to address that quickly as possible? <laughs> sure can. Um, so, Doug, the reason it doesn't go farther east is that the grass cast model, uh, you'll remember step number two. We fed the weather into the descent model, and the descent model spits out evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration works great. It's a wonderful predictor for how well grass is going to grow in systems that are in the west. But as you move further east, kind of that halfway across Nebraska, halfway across Kansas, evapotranspiration is no longer the limiting factor for grass growth. Um, it's something else. You know, it might be temperature driven or it might be precipitation driven. And so that would require a different set of, um, a, a different set of regression models. So in the future, it's possible, but currently our model is, is very ET driven and that applies to Western systems. Great. All right, um, we'll get, I see there are some questions popping up. Uh, I'm gonna try and get to all of those as soon as we can, but first, um, we are going to listen to uh, Becky give us a, a, a talk about current conditions and maybe a teeny bit about outlooks and that kind of thing. Uh, unfortunately for Becky, uh, Colorado is sort of in the crosshairs when it comes to the north central part of the US or central US in terms of where the drought is. So Becky, go ahead. And so I keep noticing every time I start the slideshow, it looks white. Is that? It is. It certainly is, is white. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't understand. We practice this. Yep. Um, try uh, advancing or not. Does that work? I've, yeah, I've advanced and it doesn't do anything. So. All right. Make it, make it small again. I name. have no idea. If, if, if it all fails, try starting it way down at the bottom. I don't know. Uh, oh, you mean yeah, this this button here. Yeah. Uh, See if it makes any difference. 
everything I've tried. I've tried starting it in different okay. ways. So stand by. I will. Uh, you keep trying. I will uh, bring it up on my screen, and we'll just um, we'll just go through it that way. And you can just say next slide, okay? Let me. Uh, I don't think I have your latest, but that's okay. Just close enough. Oh, wait a minute. You, oh, or we could just do it that way. Why don't we just do it this way? What, the way you have it right now, we're just not going to blow it up. We'll just advance this way through your slides. That's probably easiest for everybody because you can advance this way, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's just do it that way. Yeah, we'll just have I to look OK. It. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. All right, sounds good. Um, I am Becky Bollinger. I'm the Assistant State Climatologist at Colorado Climate Center, which is at Colorado State University. And I was going to give a brief overview of some of the current drought conditions we're seeing uh, in some areas of the central U.S. Yeah, I got to figure out how to forward. There we go. Um, here is a current depiction of drought across the United States, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. This was released last week and is uh, effective uh, data effective through May 5th, so last Tuesday. And we've got a few areas across the country where we're seeing drought. For those of you unfamiliar with these drought depictions, uh, where there's white, we're not seeing anything of concern yet. Uh, yellow shows abnormally dry conditions, so that's the only color that's not a drought category. And then after that, we go to D1 moderate drought all the way to our worst uh, drought depiction, which is D4 exceptional drought, which I don't believe there is any of that um, in the country right now. So you do see some pockets of D3 extreme drought uh, showing up uh, in Colorado, up in Northern California and into Oregon, uh, some in Southern Texas. And uh, those are the areas that, that are showing uh, the most severe con drought conditions right now. Zooming into just the central region of what we're talking about, um, this little table on the right tells you the percent in each category, the percent of this total area that's in those categories. So currently 1% of this region is now in a D3 category, and that is an increase from last week. So these D3 areas are new. Uh, a total of 6.5% of the region is in a drought category from that D1 to D4, and the majority of that is in Colorado, bleeding over into Kansas. Danelle mentioned it before, there's the, a whole host of, of products and, and data that we use to determine what drought conditions are, ranging from shorter term, 30 days, out to longer term, uh, probably like nine months, 12 months, and uh, even longer if necessary. So. I'm really just going to focus on one of our main drivers of drought uh, being precipitation. This map here, uh, which is uh, called the Westwide Drought Tracker, uh, released by the Western Regional Climate Center, combines precipitation anomalies and temperature anomalies uh, to show how anomalously warm and dry or cool and wet conditions are. Uh, at any given location. So in this one, uh, as of the end of April, I looked at a three-month time scale. So it takes all of you know, February, March, and April. And where you see uh, those yellows, oranges, and reds, we're looking at a combination of temperature and precipitation that strongly contributes to drought. So warmer than average, drier than average, um, and the more red the color is, the more concerning it is. So you do see where you saw those D3 areas on the drought monitor map, uh, some concerning areas on the uh, recent, uh, on this recent map here, including Southern Colorado and going into uh, the, the main plains and central plains. 
We don't just see this when we look at data. Um, we have seen it in a variety of different data sources, including like what Danell showed with the uh, GraphCast. Also in that uh, new uh, NASA Grace uh, product showing uh, both in uh, top soils and deeper into the soils, we've seen some dry conditions, uh, but we're also hearing it from the people who are living in these areas. So the photo background uh, is from a uh, USDA Farm Service agent in eastern Colorado from Kiowa County uh, showing a picture of winter wheat coming, struggling to come up uh, in mid-April. And this is not the way that a healthy winter wheat crop should look uh, as it starts coming out of dormancy. On top of that, I put an example of a condition monitoring report that uh, we read on Kokoraz. So Kokoraz is our um, nas national uh, observation network. Anybody can get a rain gauge and report the precipitation in their area. And they can also report current conditions, uh, what we call condition monitoring. You can look up those condition monitoring maps on the link there. And this was an example from uh, Western Kansas and Hamilton County, uh, where they uh, basically stated that they're not getting any moisture, uh, the temperatures are are getting worse, uh, cattle sales are picking up, um, the crops aren't looking good. Um, and so we use this information to kind of give us a, a, a bit of a ground truth of what we're seeing in the data. I wanted to show this map to kind of emphasize that the area that we're looking at is really no stranger to drought. In this example, I've taken for every county in the country, the number of times that they have gone into a D3 or worse drought. So those most extreme exceptional drought categories and for every county giving it a color based on the number of weeks since the drought monitor started back in 2000. And so where you see those reds and darker reds are counties that frequently get into those very severe drought categories more frequently than, say, all these counties in the Midwest that show up gray, uh, which have probably been in D3, D4 drought a normal expected amount of time if, if you're considering statistical frequencies. But as we get into these higher elevations, that are a little bit more arid. Um, and the concern with that is um, they still have a lot of, of croplands that they, they unfortunately see drought a lot more often. I wanted to share this tool for anybody who's interested. You can find it at this website on the top left. I, I developed this tool for a colleague at Livestock Weather. And you can look at this for any county. And really, it, it supports that idea that um, some areas just get dry more frequently. So Hamilton County in Kansas, which is in that D3, uh, here's a, a time series that shows what their precipitation for February through April looks like, which is normally about three inches. And then in the time series, you can see how often it's actually below that average of three inches. And frequently, they can get up to two inch deficit in that time period. Uh, we want to see precipitation follow a nice uh, little bell curve, uh, but we don't. What we see here is um, if you look at this tall bar, it says that most frequently that February through April precipitation in this county is below 50% of average. So more often than not, the precipitation in the uh, in the spring, entering the spring, is less than average, um, and it's very easy to build up deficits in that time period. So I wanted to show you how things have been looking at a specific station. This is from Holly, Colorado, which is in Prowers County in southeast Colorado, very close to the Colorado-Kansas border. So this brown line I want you to focus on starting at October 1st shows how precipitation normally accumulates day after day uh, through the water year, which we define as starting at October 1st. 
the green shading shows how precipitation has accumulated this water year. So we started out uh, with almost no precipitation in October. And then these little steps are you can see where we've started adding precipitation uh, to that accumulation, but very minor blips, nothing to get us near average. And then since March, these little additions of precipitation have been so small that the gap between what we've accumulated and the long-term average has grown quite a bit so that we're now at a four inch deficit built up which is the sixth driest in the 120 20, 112 years of complete data for comparison purposes i wanted to put last year uh, to show just how much variability there is and how much above average they were just last year at this time Now the good news is we are getting ready to enter the wet season. This is a map I developed that shows for a bunch of long-term stations around the country, what is their one of their top three wettest months or their top three driest months. So if it has a purple dot, that station uh, ranks in the top three wettest months uh, climatologically for May. So basically what this is showing is that for a lot of the central part of the country, we are entering the wet season. May is usually one of the top three wettest months. What this means is it can be easier to make up those deficits that we see. June is another month uh, that is very climatologically wet for a lot of the central region um, and the plains that are in drought right now. Um, the other side of the uh, the sword there is that it also becomes easier for a deficit to get bigger faster so that is something uh, to keep in mind uh, but thankfully drier conditions do become less common as we enter the warm season so i'm going back to this hamilton county in kansas example um, previously we were looking at february through april as we go into the warm season, I'm now looking at May through July. They normally get, as you can see, a wetter season. They get closer to eight inches in that period. And their deficits don't uh, drop down quite as frequently as it did in, in the uh, spring one. And when we look at the distribution, we do see that it's much more common to get near average or above average precipitation. So, um, we can hopefully hang our hats on that as we look forward to the future. Uh, this is looking at what precipitation is expected to fall over the next seven days. So a week from today, May 18th, we are hoping that um, this forecast pans out and that these are the precipitation totals we see uh, over the week. I want to focus in on two areas of interest. Uh, where we've got the drought uh, in the yellow outline, I'm showing precipitation values that are generally over an inch for the next week, uh, which would be a really nice boost of moisture for these areas and would help to chip away at some of the deficits, um, especially deficits that might not be quite as big as you move a little bit north. Um, so these areas are, are going to have good benefits. As we go south, where we have those new D3 areas in southern Colorado and into western Kansas, um, their forecast is a little bit uh, lower for precipitation amounts, generally only getting up to about a half an inch. And while that's good, it's really not going to be enough to chip away at those deficits, so you probably wouldn't see much improvement uh, in drought depiction or drought conditions if this is the amount that falls, so we'll hope for more. Going out into the long term, I uh, not totally long term, but the eight to 14 day outlook from the Climate Prediction Center. Um, over the middle to late part of May, they're starting to show a pattern where a trough builds over the western part of the country. Uh, and then you have that corresponding ridge that builds over the central and eastern part of the country. And what that means is that there is a pretty good likelihood of seeing above average temperatures uh, through a lot of our drought areas 
uh, in the central plains, um, which can be a, a, exacerbate those drought conditions a little bit. Um, so that is a concern. And then you add to that the precipitation outlook for this same time period from May 18th to May 24th. Generally, where you've got the trough, you can expect more storm activity. And where you have the ridge, you can expect more uh, calm conditions without widespread precipitation. However, those warmer temperatures are probably going to lead to localized thunderstorms bubbling up in those areas. So even where you see there's a, a slightly increased chance for below average precipitation to the south, I would say that this area here where we're in that gray strip and around our drought region could have some localized precipitation um, from those uh, from thunderstorms and the warm temperatures, um, but a lot of areas could probably miss out on that. So this is just a teaser of the amount of information you can get on uh, the central region's uh, climate and drought conditions. So I wanted to uh, point your attention to a webinar that uh, Doug will be hosting on Thursday, May 21st. Uh, Sorry about that ridiculously ugly link to register for it, um, but hopefully you guys can all join. I believe Dennis Toddy of the Midwest Climate Hub, the director of the Midwest Climate Hub, will be giving the presentation and will give a, a lot more thorough breakdown of what conditions are looking like in the central region. And that is all I have. Yep, thank you, Becky. You can go back one slide in case yep. people want to get that down. Um, yep. Thanks to all three speakers. Uh, we have officially run out of time. I'm going to run through the questions really quick, and there's only a few. Uh, and Matt, uh, you're up for the first one. And if you have to get off, just let me know, and um, maybe we can answer in a different way. Uh, question uh, was, what is, what is the uh, GRACE satellite setup that limits its spatial resolution? Um, okay, so, so a little complicated to answer, but um, uh, basically remember, so GRACE is really different because it's not looking down. It's not like it has a camera with a certain pixel resolution or something like that. It's it's really, it's making measurements of the distance between the satellites and how they're affected by the shape of Earth's gravity field. And then you take all these observations of the locations of the satellites, the distance between the satellites and how that's changing over time put that into a giant regression routine in a supercomputer and it comes up with a map of Earth's gravity field. And then we look at how that changes from month to month. And just because of the, the nature of that type of observation, the fact that the satellites are about 500 kilometers above the surface and it's, um, you know, there are a lot of other uh, things influencing the observations, including, um, you know, we have to remove the effects of the atmosphere and the oceans before we can get at the land. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for me to give you more details than that, but basically we're effectively limited just by the type of observation it is uh, in terms of the spatial resolution. If we want to get down to a higher spatial resolution, we'd have to fly the, the satellites in a lower orbit, which means there'd be more atmospheric drag, and therefore we'd have to have a system to basically um, counteract that drag, and, and there are a lot of um, technological details associated with that. We also need to have higher spatial and temporal sampling because the Earth changes more frequency than we can observe with just a single pair of satellites. So we really need to have like multiple pairs of satellites would be which would be prohibitively expensive. So um, yeah. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. It's it's uh there's a there are a lot of factors involved in that. Okay. Thank you. Yep, it does make sense to the asker. Um happens to be Mike Hobbins. Um, a couple of the questions these people have left, but I think the questions are still good. I think Danell uh, more or less answered them. Any thoughts of expanding this product, grass gas, to, through, uh, to other parts of the U.S., um, and not at this time to the east, but yes, to the uh, southwest, uh, New, all of New Mexico and, and portions of Arizona or of all of Arizona, uh, Danell? Uh, all of Arizona that are rangelands. Right, rangeland. Okay. And then um, um, for Arizona, we have a longer growing season. Will our grass cast start earlier and, and or go longer into the fall? 
Yeah, it will. Um, we are developing that right now. And currently, we are actually looking at doing a, sp a, a separate spring forecast that will start earlier and end at the end of May, and then a separate summer grazing forecast um, that would start in on June 1st and probably go through September. Uh, we have a webinar later this week with NRCS and FSA to help us determine what those what those dates should be. Excellent. Um, and then I guess we've already answered this too, but why isn't there sort of answered? But uh, the other question was why isn't there data? And I'm assuming that means grass cast information for the Colorado Western slopes. Great question. Um, so. Grass cast struggles in the western parts of Colorado and the western parts of Wyoming uh, because those areas have a lot of uh, shrublands and a lot of forests. And so step three of the grass cast model, that's where we talked about the greenness and that's the NDVI uh, index, so satellite, um, you know, remotely sensed information. Those satellite sensors have a hard time understanding um sagebrush and trees because they don't green up and brown down like grass does so step three of our grass cast model struggles in those regions someday we would love to to crack that nut <laughs> okay well thank you again danelle matt and becky i don't know if brian you have any final words or anything you'd like to say if you do go ahead um i'm going to uh also, thank everybody who stayed on uh, this long. And uh, again, we will get this uh, up on a NIDUS portal somewhere, drought.gov, at some point uh, on YouTube, if nothing else. So thank you all for uh, your help this afternoon in presenting. Uh, appreciate the audience as well uh, sticking with us. So thanks again, and talk to you all later. Bye-bye.